when you segment your list, you can customize the communication with those on your list. When you personalize and customize, you build trust. When you build trust, you build sales. various ways to do it, how to refine it, how to start big, when you should start small, how to iterate so you are not wasting your time, but getting the information that you need as quickly as possible. You know, that's one of the big things that has changed with digital marketing. Um, Wanamaker, 100 years ago, he was the founder of Woolworth. You know, he said, I know that half of my marketing dollars are wasted. I just don't know which half. Well, with digital marketing today, you can know what's working and what isn't. And very quickly, I mean, with Google AdWords, with uh, the analytics, with the Facebook metrics, everything, you know, if people are clicking, if they're opting in, you can track what is working all the way down to the size of an opt-in button, the, the phrase, the color. Does it have a border? Is it all caps? Is it black? Is it blue? Does it have a shadow? So now some of those things are obviously you're getting into the finer details. Uh, and in the beginning, that's probably too small of a detail. In the beginning, you got to go wide and then quickly narrow it down, though, to determine what works. But with the digital age, we can indeed know what works. And the more that you can customize your offering and tailor your messaging, the more likely you are to build trust with the recipients. And as you build trust, you're going to grow your sales. So that's what we're getting into. And um, you'll notice this is, I promise, the last time you hear my interview with that deep voice. I don't understand why people think that's my normal voice. I don't know. Maybe they like it. Maybe I should just switch to it. But I don't know. I've got my new microphone. I think I have a good setup here. Been tweaking some things with the gain and some other little thing. It's amazing what you can learn on YouTube. But um, tweaking some settings, working on some soundproofing. Got some um, funny looking foam things on my desk and in front of the microphone. So I'll probably be customizing that next couple of episodes. But as long as it has a deep, rich sound, but not too deep like you'll hear with Keith. But um, like I said, it's his second time on the show. Uh, he was on a couple of years ago. So, I mean, a smart entrepreneur knows how to launch and run a business, knows how to drill down uh, on the specifics. Um, we get into, you know, where are people clicking, how to quickly segment your list. You know, this doesn't have to be super intricate. You can start at the very beginning with one simple question. At least it gives you more information than what you had, okay? But the main thing is just don't throw one website up and just treat everybody the same. I always say, you know, in my sales training, especially in the Make Every Sale course, that we as salespeople have to adjust how we sell to match how the prospect buys. That's our job as professional salespeople. So knowing what's working in your marketing by segmenting your list is vital, all right? That's why I'm having Keith on. So you're in for a treat. Uh, but as I mentioned, with the Make Every Sale program, it's easy to get lost in the weeds. It's easy to get stuck. It's easy to get down on yourself. Uh, as a salesperson, as an entrepreneur, it's easy to feel like you're a lone wolf, like it's you against the world. Um, a lot of time spent you know, on the phone, in cars, traveling alone, and you feel like nobody can relate. The reality is we can all relate if we've been in sales. And as business owners, as a fellow business owner, I can relate as well to you. So where do you go to get the feedback and the input and brainstorming ideas, you know, that's reliable, that's affordable? That's where the Make Every Sale program comes in. You know, I mentioned the, the pre-done videos you can watch at any time, the workbook, the, the templates, uh, all the things that uh, I've used to grow my business, I give to you in this program. But the biggest thing, I think, is the the private group. You can ask questions anytime in the live interactive weekly calls with me and the other members. So come join us. All right. Make every sale.com enroll and grow your sales. I guarantee. 
Now let's bring on our guest. Keith Perhag, all the way from Portland, Oregon. Welcome to the Sales Podcast, man. How the heck are you? Thanks for having me. I'm, I'm doing well. Doing well. So Glad to be coming here. back. You're coming back in segmentation. So you yes. are the you're the chief cook and bottle washer at segmetra.io, correct? Mm -hmm. Yep. So you are, I don't know, you're you're either entrepreneur's worst nightmare or dream come true. <laughs> One so of the two. Know, no we, middle ground. We're dreamers. We just kind of go by gut feel, man. And we just go make stuff happen. But now you make us like slow down and chop up data and see if mm -hmm. we're just spinning our wheels, right? Right. If you're, if you're, I see it as kind of both because you got to have the great ideas. You got to say, this is some crazy thing that we don't know if it's going to work and let's try it. But at the end, you have to be able to say, well, did it really work? We got more money but was it because of what we did or something else, right? And it's, you gotta have, and I think that's why a lot of entrepreneurs and a lot of people doing product sales, they always have someone else doing the data side, right? Cause they got to keep their mind open and all the crazy crap that they can do to increase that marketing and to think like new strategies that other people haven't thought of that can increase that revenue, but they need someone else to keep them grounded and say, look, we tried this last time. It didn't work. You think it worked, but it really didn't. So, right. and that's, that's kind of the role we play is that, uh, that tie back to earth and keeping you grounded into what's actually making you more money. Right. So your tool is, um, uh, your, your, your platform is based on certain tools. And so we, you know, we don't want to get in the weeds on that because our listeners could be using thousand different platforms. Exactly. Uh, but we do want to talk about the power of segmenting the list, right? Because mm -hmm. uh, who what, was it? Wanamaker, you know, said, I, I know 50% marketing dollars are wasted. I just don't know which 50%. Yep. Yep. Exactly. He was the founder of Woolworth, I think, you know, so this was back in the twenties, I mean, thirties time frame. So, I mean, easily a hundred years at least he, and that dude was super rich. Mm -hmm. right? And I think he had a hundred million dollars, even, you know, when that used to be real money. Uh, <laughs> and uh, so this has always been a problem business, right? Mm -hmm. Is knowing what is working in it. Right. Uh, so what are, you know, what are some fundamental things, right? Like you, you're very top of the page, accurate data can trust. How, what should business owners, salespeople be measuring in the first place? There's a, there's a lot and it really depends on where your business is. And I always look at things as most of us do, I think as a funnel, right? So if you, have no people visiting your site, that's what you got to focus on first. How do you get more people to the site? If you have people visiting the site, but don't have people opting in, that's what you got to focus on. How do you get more people in the funnel? If you have people in the funnel, but they're not buying, you got to improve your offer, your, your emails. And at each step, you have a chance to create a segment and to, I, I see segmentation almost like research and segmentation to be like marketing, right? So segmentation is a great way to understand who is visiting your site and why they are purchasing, right? And so that can start even before you have any sales or any products, you can have something on your site that essentially says, hey, I wanna help you out. What's your biggest problem? Click A, B, C, right? I wanna earn more money. I wanna get a better job. I want to find love and, uh, and be happy. So what are you interested in? Clicking on that has created a segment. Now you understand something about your audience that you didn't before, and you didn't have to send them a survey. You didn't have to have them fill out this long thing that says, give me your name and email address and how many, uh, how, what's your monthly income and how many uh, uh, children do you have, et cetera, right? You found something because humans are inherently greedy, I think, or I won't say greedy, I'll say, self-absorbed. We are more interested in ourselves than other people for the majority. And when I am taking a survey, I'm not helping myself. But if I'm clicking a button that says, I really want to learn how to earn, how to earn more money. 
I am trying to help myself and you as the marketer are gaining information off of that, right? Um, so to me, that is a powerful way to understand at a very natural level what people are looking for. There's this great story about they were doing um, – customers uh, feedback and stuff. Sony was back with the Walkman and they had this, they had the, the focus groups and they have all the, the Walkman with different colors, the black ones, the yellow ones, the green ones, et cetera. And like, which one do you like best? And everyone said the yellow one, man, that yellow one looks good. And then on the way out there, like, okay, you can take any of them, take a free Walkman. Everyone took the black one. So what people say is very different than what they do and what segmentation strategies like this let you do is get past what people think they want and let you get understanding about what they really want. And then once you understand what they really want, you can then see, okay, so I have people that are asking for raises or want to earn money on the side or want to find true love. For my business, which of those are turning into the best customers, right? So now not only do I understand my audience a little bit more, but now I've been able to understand which of my audience is going to be the most valuable for me as a marketer going forward. Uh, oh, go ahead. Yeah, let me ask you something. Cause I, I talk to people I'm in, I, I tell them, you know, in business, I tell everybody, you don't have a traffic problem. You have a conversion problem, mm -hmm. right? Cause most people rarely does anybody contact me and say, I need better conversions. Right. They say, I want sales. I want more traffic. Give me more mm -hmm. traffic. I'm really good when I get in front of a person. I just, I need more, I need more at bats. I'm like salespeople is like your job is to get those at bats. But anyway, if we're talking about marketing, you know, most people have crappy conversions, right? Uh, poor headlines, poor messaging, uh, different things are impacting the conversions. Mm -hmm. so you would you have that statement? Uh, and then do you start there? Because it, based on what I'm, I'm understanding with your helping, you're not necessarily helping them get more traffic. You're helping them understand the traffic. With the traffic. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Okay. And you had, uh, you had a guest on a little bit ago, Dan, who said something very similar. He said, it doesn't matter if having a hundred thousand person list a 2 million person, person list a 4 million person list doesn't matter if you don't have the right people on there. I see people right. with, 10,000 or 20,000 person list being able to outperform people with million dollar lists because those 10,000 people, those 20,000 people are the right people, right? They are segmented in the, the marketer understands that list and they know what they want because they've segmented them and they're able to provide the right product to the right person at the right time. And when you go back to marketing, that's all sales and marketing is right person, right product, right time. Mm-hmm. So what do you see people wrong? A lot. <laughs> the first, I mean, the biggest one is that people don't segment at all, right? They, they lump people together and they say, well, people from Facebook are doing this. Well, that's, that's a really big swath, right? And even people within Facebook, were those people in Facebook that were already on your list? Were they not on your list? Have they been on your list for three years? Like you don't know. And I think that, so we, we talked a little bit about segmentation as research about understanding what types of people that come into your funnel. And I guess the biggest thing that I see people not doing is kind of segmentation as marketing. Uh, Facebook segmentation is really segmentation as research, right? So you're able to say, I want to target men from age 30 to 40, or I want to target women from age 45 to 60, right? Or maybe I want to target people in the Eastern United States or whatever it is, right? That's a, that's a research segmentation. But at what point do you understand how much those people are turning into customers and what actions they are taking inside the, your marketing funnels are converting them? All right. So we talked about that segmentation as research where they're coming in, they're, they're getting added to your lead funnel. And then we really want to look at what actions do they take in that marketing funnel that turn them into, into valuable customers, right? So is that something like, well, people from 
Facebook want a cheaper product to start and then they will upgrade later? Or are they more of a initial big purchase and then you upsell them on something smaller, right? Mm -hmm. What's the price point that they uh, move towards? What's the marketing speech that they move towards? What's the age range that they identify with, right? So can we, it, it seems to me that the entrepreneur though could get in trouble. They could slice and dice this thing a million different ways. That math theory or, or what law basically that if, if you do is get 50% closer, you never get to your destination, right? right? Yeah. So should they start super big blocks and slowly refine, you know, or do they you jump in and start slicing a hundred different things? Now, I, and that's, that's a big problem that I see is that people really go, they'll have a hundred thousand different tags, right? They'll yeah. say like, I want to focus on everything. They'll have, I want age ranges that are down to two years. And I want to focus on, are they male or female? What state are they in? What city? And like all these things, mm -hmm. just like, you know, we are talking with the, your marketing funnel where you start at the top and then, so you work on visitors, then you work on leads, then you work on sales. You do the same thing with the segmentation where you start with a single question, you get an answer to that question. And then you say, well, did that improve or did that make things worse? And if it improved, okay, let's segment that again. Let's look at that again. So, you know, we were talking a little bit about what are your leads interested in? So this is a great thing that you can do even after you opt in. So let's say you have a Facebook lead come in, they've opted in for a PDF and you send them an email and you say, hey, I have some, thanks for downloading the PDF, this is awesome. I have another present for you. I want to teach you either A, B, or C. You can only choose one. I want you to choose which one you really want, and I'll send that to you right away, right? So now you've been able to see, first of all, they're interested in this PDF, so you have one data point. Now you're able to get a second data point about what they want. Maybe it's, maybe you want to figure out if they are married, single, or have kids, right? So you have three different, PDFs. You have one that says, hey, if you're single and you're, you're looking to invest, here's what you should do. If you're married but don't have kids yet, here's what you should do. If you have kids and are looking to build a foundation, here's what you should do. Click on the one that's for you, and now you have another segmentation data point. And now you can start looking at, okay, are people with families more likely to purchase? Are they more price sensitive or less price sensitive, right? So now we have a second segmentation tier that we can easily look at and say, okay, show me all the people who have this married with kids tag and show me how much they're worth compared to everyone else that isn't married, right? Did that go up? Did that go down? How often are your clients surprised, all right? Because I can imagine show up, hey, we know our business. We know our process. We know our clientele. We've, we've broken this down and they go, oh, crap. Uh, this is not what we expected. <laughs> More often than not, a lot of times, so if you're at the beginning of your marketing career and you're just starting a new product, there's a ton of surprises about big things, right? Mm -hmm. Like there's, oh, we didn't realize that 90% of our customers were women, right? That kind of stuff. As, you, as you've been doing it for two to th a year or so, you kind of get into, okay, we know those top level. There's no big surprises, but you get lots of surprises like, I always thought that a upsell should be less than the initial sale product. Well, let's try it. What happens if we segment it and show a more expensive, so we have a $200 product and we give them a $700 upsell. Holy crap, we just, made, we just doubled our revenue. How did we do that? That's, that blew my mind, right? So these are things that you can test and, and, segment, and segment and report on that you're not going to have that goes against what you thought. And that's why I think that, you know, we were talking earlier, entrepreneurs need to be able to keep their head kind of in the clouds for that kind of stuff, right? They need to think not what do we know and let's move on to that, but also what could come out from just left field and really change the business because no one is expecting it. Uh, we used to, we use segmentation a lot for split tests and especially campaign split tests where we run people through multiple different campaigns. We see which one uh, 
does the does the best. One of the things that we've always talked about when doing split testing is we always do if we're doing three split tests, we do two that are solid that we that they're like these are things that we think will move the needle, and they are based on research and these are safe bets. And then we always do one that's just completely out there, like what if we just have the entire email sequence be memes, right? Or it's all cat photos or something like that, right? Because you'll be surprised how much of the time that stands out and can actually increase revenue. I did the cat photo one is actually real. I had a client who he was just like screwing around. He's like, I'm just gonna put cat photos in all of these emails. And he's just like got the little hang in there, cat and like a derpy cat and all this stuff. And people love the emails. The response rate went through the roof sales increased and it's like people liked this levity coming in to their their conversation yeah it's um i always tell this to you you know when i was learning how to play golf man uh lee i was 24 years old uh you know and i'm a big guy 6'2 230 uh, you know back then i mean i was lifting all kind of weights i mean i was really strong I'm learning golf and they're like, well, the average for, you know, hits a golf club, uses a seven iron to hit a 150 yard shot. And I couldn't I reach it. I couldn't reach the 150 yards for the seven iron. And I was like, what's wrong with me? And I just got out of frustration. Like I went to an eight iron, right? And I said, well, I'm shorter. I better hit this really hard. And I kind of blew the 150. <laughs> You know, then I went down to a nine iron. Well, nine it ends up, you know, nine iron, even a wedge is about right for me. Cause I realized I'm like, I'm, I'm four inches tall and, you know, 60 pounds heavier than the average guy that they're mm -hmm. talking about. So, kind of like the cat videos, right? I want to, by going to an eight and a pitching wedge to me was like throwing, was like hitting, you know, throwing out cat videos yep. and memes, but it worked. Right. But I'm so stuck in the, in the normal and average that it just, it, it literally, it hindered me for a full year of frustration. Right. Like, why can't I get there? Cause in the back of my brain, I had too much club. So I would, I would try to baby it instead of using the proper club fully. Right. You know, but it sounds like, like in business that it, it sounds like that, that hinders aspects of our lives, right? Even yeah. marketing. And I think it's important to do the incremental and to try the incremental, but it's also sure. like you said, you have to take one outlier. Yeah. I mean, it's why a lot of us became entrepreneurs in the first place. Like I, we could have done the safe job at a safe company and gotten a salary and clocked our days every like nine to five, but we decide we want to swing for the fences. And yeah. sometimes in our business, sometimes we have to take that incremental step and sometimes we have to swing for the fences. Yeah. yeah. So it's applied to, to just everything. I mean, <laughs> voicemail messages. I mean, mm -hmm. should, should I, I, you know, every third or fifth post on LinkedIn, should it be a cat? I mean, right. Exactly. And it's interesting. You notice you mentioned the voicemail thing. We had, we've stuck this onto webinar sequences all the time and we say, okay, here's people who opt in for webinars are how much is someone who attends the webinar worth? versus someone who doesn't. How right. much is it worth if someone gives us their email address to give them an SMS message saying, hey, by the way, we're gonna have this thing. How much is that worth compared to someone who just attends the webinar? Right. How much is it worth if someone watches the replay? How much is it worth if the webinar is at 2 p.m. versus 4 p.m., right? Mm -hmm. What's our conversion rate? These are all places where we can test and segment and understand more about our audience and what in that marketing funnel causes people to purchase. Because at the end of the day, as marketers, that's what we're looking for. What is it that people on our list respond to? And what can we do to make them convert more and turn them into better customers? Right. Uh, how do you keep them being overwhelming though? Because I know, I mean, the typical entrepreneur, even this, like I get excited about this for about three minutes. <laughs> <laughs> and then it's just like plugging this into infusion soft and, oh, horrible. and creating tags and workflows and if then decision diamonds yeah. and i was like holy crap i just want to sell something right 
you know, but I do know about myself. I'm not, I got to give that to somebody. Yeah. And I, and I think that, I mean, that's one thing that I've learned with business is that the things that you don't enjoy, you don't, you aren't good at, and that are just a slog. There's people who love doing that. There's Mm -hmm. people who love organizing campaigns. There are people who love managing tags. There are people who love doing support emails, right? And I'm not one of them, but there's oh, whatever people that aren't, if you're just <laughs> listening to this, go look at the video. I mean, Keith, he's got the button shirt. He's got the pocket <laughs> protector. He's got, he's got a roll of tape on his glasses. Tell I do. This I guy, I mean, he, he probably a slide ruler and loves it. Come I, on. I don't like customer support, but I, man, I love these numbers, these numbers. Uh, and then, I mean, this is why, and this, this is actually why we built this software. So I was doing analytics and marketing stuff for bunches of marketers for a number of years and they always needed the numbers pulling them out of Infusionsoft was the worst thing on the planet. I mean, it takes three to five hours to pull a good report. You have to put them all into Excel, do pivot tables. And my partner and I were looking and it's like, we got to do this faster. Like there's just no way we can keep doing this. And so we did this and we were like, well, it's all in there. So can we just pull the data in and say, okay, show me everyone with this tag. And like two seconds later, you have an answer. And then it's like, well, how much money did they spend? Two seconds later, you have an answer. And that's, that's what I think is so exciting for me about this is that I always hated pulling the data because it's time consuming. I like looking at the data. Right. But like if we're knowing the data, knowing the data exactly. Right. So you were saying you hate setting this stuff up. It's, it's, it's a pain, especially for people who are not into the numbers. What we kind of do and what I think is the benefit of Segmetrics is having someone where you just set up the campaign. You don't have to set up the tags that cause them to report on this or do this. All you say is, okay, anyone who I'm going to send them an email with the replay I'm just going to tag anyone who clicks on that replay link. That's super easy to do. Like it takes four seconds. You, you had a marketing idea. You put that into place. And then Segmetrics or the analytics guy or whoever that is, is able to report on that, right? Because it's already slurping in all that data. So you had an idea and you were able to implement it. And then afterwards, you're able to just report on it as you, without having to pull all this data and without having to be... Uh, an analytics guy and have to worry that, Oh man, did I add these two numbers wrong? Or did I export the wrong data from, from Infusionsoft or whatever? Right. What's uh, what's like a crazy case study you can, I'm sure somebody was probably just sitting on piles of money. They just go to, to segment and test and send another offer. So the, the two that come to mind. So one was the one where we did a upsell that, uh, that was more expensive than the, than the original well, product. And that was it for to $700. It was, it was more than that. Uh, kind of NDA, NDA. So I don't want to give out too much, but I, it was a significant increase. It was more than five X, uh, the price and sales went down. So the number of products that we sold on that upset went down, but it's five X the price. So oh, the sure. amount of revenue is just going through the roof. Um, the other one that we did that I thought was really interesting was that we had gotten published in a large, uh, like kind of a Huffington Post level uh, post, right? And we had people coming into this landing page. I think we got 80,000 people in, in four hours. And so they were split testing this thing left, right, and forward. They were like every 10 minutes, they were trying a new split test to get more people in, et cetera, et cetera. And it had taken them a long time to hook up this deal with uh, with the publication. And they were like popping champagne bottles. They're like, we just got 80,000 leads. This is going to be awesome. This is amazing. They sent them through a sales funnel. And they made, I think, like a dollar. Mm. Because they had 80,000 leads. And they were not quality leads, let's be honest. Right. And they were all upset that they were getting emails. They were like, I didn't give you my email address to get on your list, blah, blah, blah. And this was years ago before GDPR and all that. But they were just so upset that, I mean, we were so excited for that time period. And then a month later when they pulled the reports, they were like, oh, it was worthless, absolutely worthless. But then we decided, well, let's look at it six months later. So six months later, we did a retroactive on it. And we found that the average person was worth $2. 
for 80,000 people. So we made about $160,000 uh, in four hours from them because the initial sales were really bad, right? But once we looked at it as a, at a longer time period and we were able to segment and say, okay, these people are crap leads. So we need to give them a little more nurture, right? So we sent them through a, a longer nurture campaign. We're like, hey, this is who we are. This is what we do. Here's some awesome offers that might help you. And we were able to nurture them into a much higher um, How long revenue bracket. How was? Was it weeks Six months. or months? Months. Yeah. So first month was nothing. Six months was an extra $160,000 from those leads. Yeah. Okay. Um, better than poke an eye with a sharp stick, right? Yeah. <laughs> but if you're counting on a hundred grand in a two week long, right. It takes six months to get 160. I mean, they may still be considering that a failure, at least in the short term. They're, right. You could be sweating it right till that happens. And you get that longer term, uh, you know, of what your, your list is really worth. Mm -hmm. um, and that's something we see a lot with Facebook ads because people, what's really important to see is how long does it take until a Facebook ad become pays for the ad, right? So, you know, your cost per acquisition, but what's your return on investment and how long does it take, right? Is, are you able to get return on investment in seven days, in 14 days, in a month? How long does someone from Facebook need to have that nurturing campaign before they're willing to give you money? And depending on your product and depending on your audience and depending on what that, who that ad is targeted to, that can vary quite a bit. And I'm also looking at the comprehensive effort of the customer of, of your customers, the business owners, because on the one hand, okay, I ran an ad within six months, I monetize it to 60 grand, mm -hmm. but I mean, there's a difference between if they saw the ad, are they on an email newsletter? Do they subscribe to the past? Am I a regular blogger? Am I active in a LinkedIn group for that segment? And maybe, you know, along those six months, they, they saw, you know, 287 postings of me. Mm -hmm that monetize this versus somebody that just clicked the ad and maybe was retargeted. Right. 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 So can you, can you help like, yeah. is it even possible to measure all of that to see really what's driving that revenue? Yeah. And if that's, and that's going back to the, you need those types of questions. You need the entrepreneur to be able to come up with those questions because those are all answerable, answerable questions. How many times, yeah. Did, is there a touch point with this person? How many ads did they click on? How many times did they visit the site? What finally tipped them over to become a customer, right? Mm -hmm. These are all things that are a hundred percent answerable if you have the questions, right? And that's, well, if you have the questions and the software, right? You'd also need the software, but, but that's what we provide, right? So <laughs> I consider that part a kind of solved Solve yeah. box. So, so you can look that comprehensively at everything mm -hmm. and help them. Okay. Exactly. So I can say, okay, show me everyone who's clicked on this Facebook ad and then how long it took them from when they clicked on it to when they became a lead. And then how long did it take them to purchase? Right. right? And how much right. revenue did they generate over how many days? So everyone from Facebook on the fifth day, how much revenue do I generate per person? Right. Yeah. That's, um, Typical entrepreneur is not going to do all this. Cause I mean, the argument, <laughs> it could be made. I mean, you can, you, you can sit around there, you know, and major in the minors mm -hmm. right, and, and never get it. What's that theory? I'm trying to look it up on another screen, that math. Um, oh, the, the, the half theory. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I'll, I'll look it up. Um, so, all right. I, I love the concept of testing things like higher prices on the upsell, testing something totally radical, right? Like mm -hmm. with, the, with the meme. So basically test A, B, C, and then Z641-5, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's basically what you're saying. Yeah, go down. Um, yeah. And it's always things like, it doesn't even have to be that detailed. It can also be things like, okay, I have four emails that people click on during my sales cycle mm -hmm. or during my sales, uh, my open cart. 
which of them brings me the most money, which of them right. gets clicked on the most, which of them brings me in the most money, uh, which one has the most upsells, which one's the most convincing, things like that. Or even if you have multiple products, which I hope at some point everyone does, people who buy product A, what else do they buy? Is, right. Are people who buy product A more likely to buy product B or C? Which one should I market them to next? Right? And being able to understand what gets you the most money. And that's why I like Psychmetrics because everything's tied back to that lead value. So I can have any questions like, okay, people who click this, this email, are they worth more or less than people who don't click it? Right. Or I have two emails, which one's worth more money to me? And it makes me very quickly be able to see what is the dollar value of any action I'm doing in my marketing. Should there always be a test? Should everything, should I no, split test every email? How, how, how crazy no. should we get? Should I, should I be split test? You know, I send an email and click here in red or one click here in green or click here with a yellow box. I mean, no, I, so here, here's the thing about split testing uh, is that because of you want a big enough difference between the tests to make sure that you are, are sure that the result is accurate, right? And so doing lots of small tests, especially if you don't have a list of 200, 500,000 people, you're never gonna get an answer, right? I talk, when I talk about split tests, I talk about testing ideas, right? So I'm not testing like, is this button blue and this button's red? I'm talking about, I have a 14 day funnel and I wonder, can I get money, the same amount of money in half the time if I do a seven day funnel? All right, let's split test that, right? Big changes. I lo there's, as entrepreneurs, we don't have enough time in the day to do everything we wanna do. So I would never focus on the minutia of should this, should I use the word hi or hey in my emails? It's not gonna make a difference. But what might make a difference is okay, if I send an email that says, hey, get on a phone call with me, how many people are going to take, a, take me up on that, right? Or click here to get an automated message from me. Like just things that are so out right. of the box and different that they will make a difference, right? Now, but basically though, I mean, what I tell people is like start big. Mm -hmm. Like, like if, you're, if you're Ford, right, run an ad for with a picture of a truck, a picture of a minivan, a picture of the Mustang. Right. Okay, if the truck overwhelmingly wins, then, then do a red truck, a blue truck, a yellow truck. Exactly. Right? Okay, yellow truck wins. Okay. Two door, four door, four door dually. Mm -hmm. So then start refining, right? So, yep. so it's not like like don't test the things, but but don't start with the little things. Start with the big, then ref Right. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And it doesn't have to be that. I mean, a lot of people I think have a, a natural version to testing because they think it's frustrating. It's hard. You can do segmentation without necessarily doing a test. So one of the stories I, I like to tell, there was this guy who was putting together um, tax forms for small business people. So essentially it's all the all the forms that you need to create your small business and to get it running and to do everything you need to do. Right. And he, his sales weren't great. So he had the great idea of, well, what if I segment them down? So now I have all the forms you need. If you are a designer, all the forms you need, if you are a dentist, all the forms you need, if you are a freelance programmer. And because people thought this is exactly for me, sales went through the roof, right? Because, he's segmenting his list here. And not only is he segmenting his list and getting more revenue, he's also now able to see, okay, what type of people are buying my forms, right? Is it more designers or is it more dentists? Is it uh, real estate agents? Who are my customers? As well as, hey, look, my revenue just went through the roof, mm -hmm. right? It's all about people like it when you talk to them and their specific use case. Um, I had a friend who had bingo card software and he had a bunch of testimonials on the front page and he had this one and 90% of his customers were middle-aged school moms, right? So women generally age 45 to 60. And my, and my father-in-law. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and he had 
uh, he had a bunch of good testimonials and he had one from a, from a male uh, customer who was really good. It was written really well. And he had one from a female customer whose name was Sue. And it was just like, I like this software. And he put them both on the t top page and he tested them. And the really crappy one from the woman just kicked butt, like 90% better sales yeah. because people identified with it. They right. said, this person is like me. They said, yes, I am going to now buy this product. Right. right. And that's what the segmentation is all about. Because once you understand what motivates your your leads and what motivates your customers, you can then talk specifically to them and then understand, hey, I had the same problem as you. I had A, B, C. I know you do too. And that creates that connection. And that yeah. in the end is what allows us to sell better and to become better marketers. Yeah. You got to talk their language. Exactly. Exactly. Very cool, man. So where should we send people? What, um, what action should they take? Um, uh, getting better at this, either they don't have the, um, the correct software yet. Mm -hmm. They don't have infusion solve or you got HubSpot coming, right? So, yep. Um, well, one of the things, I mean, we put together a couple of guides that, um, that help people without software understand segmentation and how to put it together and how to understand where your customers are coming from and what they're doing. And it's simply very easy to put up in your own stuff. Uh, I can give you a link. It's going to be uh, segmetrics.io slash loves sales podcast. Loves sales loves podcast. Sales podcast. Whoa. Yeah. I like that. I, yeah, and we can get that uh, ready and put that up. And easy peasy, uh, it's a PDF kind of walks you through how to segment people and how to understand who's on your list and what to do with it. <laughs> hey, I think everybody should just go there anyway. <laughs> just because it's cool. Uh, I'm going to copy and paste of that there. Okay. Cool. All right. Yeah, because it's, I'm talking about. I mean, it is. It's important, and we don't have to do everything ourselves. I, I highly encourage y'all listening to this: don't do everything yourselves. Uh, the sooner you can outsource stuff, you know, automate, delegate, and dominate. Yeah, you know, that's the key. You will go crazy trying to do stuff on your own, but you'll waste so much time and money as well. I mean, we're all sitting on you know that story, acres of diamonds, right? We're all just sitting on gold mines we just got to mine our data uh better and and find it yeah you know we work so hard and i think it's just human nature too at least for salespeople. it was that way for the longest time it's like i just i love the thrill of that you know i wanted to make the sale and go to the next mm -hmm. but man, stop thinking about the first sale start the fourth sale yeah. You know, what do I have to do to get this to come to me four times? Yep. Um, and you're holding a change for the better when you start applying that. So, and the software is going to help. So yeah. very cool, man. Thank you. And one thing that's, that's interesting that I've seen, so we've been doing a lot of research into our own customer base and most of the people who we reach out to, they do not do their own analytics. So they always have an agency or someone they have as a consultant or freelancer doing this for them because it's not in their best interest to right. be the one pulling this numbers. They need the report. They need yeah. someone to come and say, Hey, look, did you know that X? And they go, Oh my God. Yeah. I did not know that we should totally do something with X. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's the value you get. Well, and it's also, you know, I always talk to people and they'll say like, um, well, Wes, you know, how much experience do you have in the uh, alpaca uh, uh, racing <laughs> and juggling industry? You know, and I'm like, uh, none, uh, which is why you want me. Yep. You know, you an outsider with no sacred cows to come in and question everything, turn over every stone because it's – it's that curse of knowledge. We're just to our own business and everything else. Mm -hmm. And we just, our assumptions and whatnot, just, 
uh, and we just overlook things that were valuable and they're right in front of us. So, so find even an outsider, maybe even preferably an outsider to come in and really shake your world, uh, yeah. to start turning over these big rocks and, um, acres of diamonds, baby. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> just got to know where to look. They're all there. All right. Well, we will let that. So, uh, segmentrics.io slash loves sale podcast. Man, that's a long one. Why do... All right. We'll, we'll stick with it. Everybody are smart. They'll get it right. So, man, I up up there at Portland. And uh, if you don't, come to SoCal, man. We'll go wine tasting, drink some beer. That'd be fun. That'd be good. We It'll should do that. Warm, all right. Two best places in the country for wine and beer. So. That's true. That's true. <laughs> Very nice. All right. right. Thank you so Keep much, man. Thanks.io. Thanks for coming on the sales podcast, man. Thank Have a great you. day. You too. Few companies segment at all. That blew my mind. Um, as I mentioned in the beginning, you know, start with a single question, measure the result, and refine. You can have a little pop up, right? But be thinking, you know, I always tell people run with a successful ad for as long as you can. All right, but understand it will eventually stop working and it usually stops working immediately. So you need to have some backup campaigns and concepts that you can run with, which means you're always testing, right? You're, you're working against the, the standard, right? So you have something that performs, but always be iterating, be willing to test things. Um, otherwise, you're going to be forced into taking action when things just stop working. And that is just not a good way to grow. All right. So be split testing, be thinking about that. That's one of the reasons I switched over to HubSpot years ago. Uh, I can have dynamic content. I can have smart forms, uh, smart CTAs, all right, calls to action. So these buttons can change based on how you come in. You know, are you at a different country? Have you opted in for one lead magnet. So now I can present you with another one. Same thing that Amazon does, that Netflix does, you know, I can do with HubSpot. So if you're looking for that kind of power, if you're looking for a CRM and marketing automation, let's talk. Uh, I've been working with them uh, since the end of 2014. So four and a half years, going on five years, and I'm a gold partner with them. I don't talk about that enough, but um, that's what I do as well as run the Make Every Sale program. Come hang out with us, all right? A bunch of motivated entrepreneurs, salespeople. You can pick my brain live every week to help you grow. That's makeeverysale.com. I promise. This is the last time with the deep voice. But I hope you got a lot of value out of the interview anyway. I'll go sell something. <laughs> <laughs>